Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is going to be part four in the restoration series of repairing the uh, crate amplifier. Uh, just as a quick recap, recap. We actually recapped the entire board. Uh, well, didn't replace every capacitor. The big, big ones over towards our power supply we didn't replace, but uh, replaced quite a bit. Uh, a lot used in the audio chain and a lot used to create our uh, 16 or 15 volt rail. But anyways, uh, two, two potentiometers as well. If you can't see in the background, my sons are going to be helping me out to finish out this video. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, well, we got quite a bit of parts that we're going to have to, excuse me. We have quite a bit of parts that we're going to have to get some rust off of. Uh, so we're going to get this in to a solution of, uh, of vinegar, allow them to sit for a little bit, and then probably take a wire wheel to it off of my Dremel, get them polished up. Um, what else are we going to have to work on here? We also have quite a bit of sanding we need to do. For the chassis where our amplifier sits into you can see quite a bit of rust yeah. i have to find some way to tackle this this back post here um, the retainer and the nut fell out not quite sure how i'm going to do that but yeah we're going to have to get that retainer yeah. and nut back into there i'm not sure if we'll be able to solder it because i'm not sure what type of metal this is uh, or if i can get enough heat on it to to get it to stick well, that's gonna have to get done we got quite a bit of cleaning to do on the amplifier itself you can see yeah. lots of rust now I'm not gonna take all these screws out yeah. um, and put them in vinegar and then polish them up afterwards uh, I'm probably just going to do my best to clean them while they're attached and maybe take a while wire wheel to the to the tops to knock off quite a bit of that uh, Quite a bit of all that uh, that rust and corrosion. Um, you know, I don't I don't personally mind a uh, somewhat worn and uh, patinaed. You know, this is a plastic and rubber material, but uh, somewhat worn and older looking amplifier. I think it gives it character. Uh, but we will definitely address this mesh right here that covers the speaker. We're going to have to take these out, um, get this pulled tight, probably use some type of two-part epoxy to get this sitting right again. But uh, mostly just some general clean cleaning, and then we'll get it all put back together and uh, test it one more time uh, and, and close out the video. So there is one more thing I wanted to address before moving on with the restoration. And if you remember, we had that uh, dual channel op amp where the... Uh, output pin at pin 1 and the output pin at pin 7 uh, only had uh, were actually kind of quote unquote electrically connected together through uh, 112 uh, K ohms of uh, resistance and the best the, the only thing on the schematic that I think matches this uh, what we're seeing on the board the most would be this section right here now again this is not the correct schematic uh, so I don't believe all these values to be uh, what we have in our amplifier but at least gives me an indication of what's going on so we have on um, uh, the output of one of the one of the op amps uh, you can see a feedback circuit uh, controlling the gain of uh, the second channel of the op amp, I guess the way to put it is dual channel op amp. Um, typically when you are looking at these op amps on the board, you'll see something like one Charlie three A and then one Charlie three B. Both of these say A, which I think is just a mislabel because look down here you have an A, one Charlie four A and one Charlie four B. Same thing up here, one Charlie one A, one Charlie one B. So this is probably the B side. But anyway, so I think you have the output of the A, 
Uh, it's being used, well, it's being sent to the inverted side of, of B, it should be B, and then the output of B is being used in, in a feedback circuit to control how much amplification comes out of A, um, or it comes out of B, sorry. I did uh, in resistance mode between uh, pin 1 and pin 7. Uh, move around the lead potentiometer a bit. Uh, I didn't see much movement just right in there, but anyways, this is kind of uh, a little reminiscent to me of maybe a buffering circuit. Um, I don't know where you're just trying to keep a constant uh, threshold uh, or amplitude out of one side of the uh, amplifier. Um, that's that's the only thing I can really think of. Uh, trying to clean up the uh, the audio as it passes through, shape it a little bit maybe. But um, oh, somebody who's uh, who understands this a little bit better than I do. Uh, well, actually, probably a lot of y'all understand this a little more than than I do. Uh, put the comments in over in the doobly doo and, and let me know exactly what's going on here. Okay, with that a little bit out of the way, uh, well now. Take our rusty hardware here, screws and nuts and bolts and stuff, get them into some vinegar, start clean, cleaning that off, uh, get some things polished up and get the case worked on, and then some final testing before we close out the video.
best I can think of. Had a bit of difficulty figuring out where these wires went because uh, uh, way back when my hard drive uh, met its demise, I lost those photos stored on that external hard drive. Uh, went back and reviewed the video. I think it was uh, video two and. Well, other than just kind of seeing a short layout of the board and kind of where the wires were running, a good portion of this was hard to see what was going on. Uh, so I was able to figure out most of how everything went back together. But uh, luckily, um, before I deleted the photos off my phone, I remembered that I made a new backup and I had to fished through some old uh, different folder on my computer and was able to find the right photos in order to put this back together. But, uh, I believe I got it together okay so we're going to plug it in and I'm going to engage a bit of a squint factor. Alright, here goes the, the test and Engage and squint. Hey, she is on. All right. Well, since she is on and nothing has blown up, um, maybe I let it uh, run for a little bit and feed a tone through it and uh, check out the oscope, see what's going on. So I got everything hooked up as well as I think I can. Um, have the SIGGEN going to the 0 dB input uh, currently set at 80 Hertz and 52 millivolts. Uh, that's per the schematic diagram I have um, that I'm going by for this test. Uh, and then I have my SIGGEN hooked up to the speaker out so I can test the audio coming out. Uh, have a 10 by probe hooked up and the, and channel 1 set to 10 by so I can get an accurate peak to peak voltage measurement. Now as you can tell right now I currently have everything uh, actually on the front for channel B everything is set to max. Volume max, low is at max. So is mid, high. Uh, everything else, channel A, is all count fully counterclockwise, and my reverb is fully counterclockwise. Also, bright is off. Okay, so want to make sure that y'all understand the entire setup here. Okay, uh, it's probably about the best as I'm going to be able to put on screen. Now, I'm going to take my volume pot, and I want you to notice that that sine wave. You see how it's cut off uh, at the top and the bottom lower portion of the uh, of the sine wave. Uh, that is because uh, it is clipping that audio because of how much amplification is there. So I'm going to back off the volume pot just a smidge to have a nice sinusoidal waveform. Wave so it's clipping right about there and backing off to right there. And that is essentially at 84.8 millivolts peak to peak. So I'm going to record that voltage down. 84.8 0. Okay. Now I'm going to take, since I am testing low at 80 hertz, I'm going to take my low potentiometer and t turn it counterclockwise. And we should see that the amplitude of that sine wave decrease. As it decreases, I'm going to decrease my vertical scale.
Okay. So we go from 84.80 down to essentially uh, 23.8, bouncing between 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 24. Uh, I'll just put 23. Point. That's kind of staying out there at 23. Two, six, two, four. I'll take the median and just put 23.4 volts peak to peak. All right. Now to turn this back clockwise. Put my load back to max since I have recorded that value. And we now need to test the mid range, which is done at 1K Hertz. So to do that, I should have made that change. 1K Hertz. There we go. And let's change our horizontal scale, span per division. And we have audio clipping again. So I'm going to take my volume potentiometer and slowly decrease till we have a nice waveform. Too much little we'll say it's about uh, let's make this just slightly that's not gonna work probably about there uh, and that's given us about 82.4 Now I'm just going to go ahead and record that down. I saw it once, so that's why I'm recording. 82.4 millivolts peak to peak. Now in order to test the mid, because our mid and high potentiometers are tied together, the way they're set up in the circuit, we actually have to decrease both of these. Starting first with the high, and as I decrease, you'll see that the amplitude drops on that waveform. So I need to change my scope vertical scale. And fully counterclockwise gets us down to 25 volts speed to peak. Now I'm going to adjust my mid potentiometer. that is fully down and we are now getting uh, it's like 10.4 yeah middle volts is uh, kind of jumping around there so I'll just write down 10.4 millivolts okay now let's max these back out be my mid-range 82.4 to 10.4 now let's go to high which is 5 kilohertz so we'll change this 5 kilohertz change my horizontal scale again on the oscope 
and let's back off because we are clipping. I do not want to test, take a measurement during when the audio is clipping. That will give me an inaccurate measurement. All right. So we'll say that's right about there. And that is going to be 82.4. 82.40 all right now for the high for the low we just did uh, for 80 Hertz we just did the low for the mid at 1k Hertz we did the high and the mid pot counterclockwise and for the high at 5k Hertz we are only adjusting the high potentiometer counterclockwise so let's see where this brings us down to wrong way okay and that's getting us down to 9.44 volts peak to peak cool now with that done uh, let's uh, let's compare our tech data and see how much db loss that was i just want to walk you through a couple things uh here is the schematic you know the one i said that matches closest to the guitar uh spending more time with it uh, we do have the gain control on here for channel A, uh, we do have focus written in here. There goes that 50k pot on channel A. Here goes another potentiometer. Um, it's labeled P2. I'm not sure where that goes to. Well, I, I mentioned that to say that we see this uh, change dex description. Description, I assume from G80XL to GX80. Now, online, if you were to look up a G80XL, it would be the amp that I have up on my bench. Um, they go for about $100, $99 used. Uh, the GX80 is about a $200 amp. The main difference is instead of the XL, where in, on channel A you have uh, gain, level, sub, focus and lead on the GX80, no XL, uh, you have slightly different controls on channel A, at least by nomenclature. On the front of the amp, it will say gain level, low, shape, and heavy. But I assume that those amps are very similar at least because of this diagram I mean there are some differences I believe from what we've tested but they at least must be fairly similar uh, so it's very possible that this G80 XL could be completely modified to operate no different than the GX80 that sells for higher, especially since the schematic is pretty similar. Uh, you just have to go component by component and change out the values where they're different so you can get the tone that you're looking for in the GX80 versus the G80XL. But anyways, so here's where I was Looking at those conditions, volume, high, mid, low at 10, bright off with load input, signal 82 millivolts, peak to peak, 82 or 52, I think I put 52 in, but uh, it's hard to tell what that is stamped on this PDF. Might have been 82, I might have been too low, but 
either way. Uh, there goes test points. Test point one would be after one Charlie one alpha. You take the output of that op amp and see if you're at 4.7 volts peak to peak. But uh, what I care about is this information right here. Right here in this little box. Because that's what we were using to test on channel B. Low 10 dB of range at 80 Hz, mid 16 dB range at 1 kHz, and high 17 dB range at 5 kHz. And we were all over the place uh, prior to changing out these uh, capacitors, swapped out that one op amp. But now we should be able to see what our new values are at. So uh, you're looking for, if, if you're not wanting to do the math yourself, you're looking for a uh, decibel to voltage gain and loss calculator. So you can take your reference voltage and then put in the voltage after, from your reference to calculate out how much dB loss you have. So in this instance, we started out with, uh, for low at 80 Hertz, 84.8 volts peak to peak and fully counterclockwise that took us down to 23.4 which comes to 11 dB of loss well that's definitely well within the range that we have here 10 dB so just slightly more loss or if you're going from zero upwards uh, slight more gain I think that's perfectly acceptable so now let's check our mid 1k Hertz we started out with 82.40 and we are seeing 17 almost 18 dB of loss again I believe that to be fully acceptable so we should be good there now for our high value started out with 82.40 at 5k Hertz and down to 9.44 18 going getting pretty close to 19 I, th I think that was the one that was giving us that super high but uh, a lot more loss than what we're looking at now but anyways 17 DB range that's perfectly acceptable in my opinion so I think we're operating as we should now with this amplifier. And uh, to be honest, I'm gonna say one of the capacitors we changed out. Uh, let's go to page two. So here's leading to our speaker. Here goes tip 142. Tip 147, and I believe uh, coming in from Y. I'm fairly positive one of the caps that we replaced was in this section. actually might have been two caps and most likely were these right here 
Okay, with those tests out of the way, I want to go over a couple more things uh, before we button this all back together and um, plug my guitar into it and just do a little playing around, test it out. But um, as I mentioned, I had to find a way to re-secure this. So what I've done is I, I super glued the one end of the retainer for this nut in there and I had that tape over it. You might have saw that earlier. Um, now that super glue is dried, I've taken a two-part epoxy JB Weld, put it over the top of that end, and then inside this area right in here, maybe I can zoom in a bit. Uh, just inside of the nut and down in there, I went ahead and put a little bit more JB Weld as well as underneath the retainer and in between the retainer and the chassis. And hopefully that JB Weld works well enough uh, and it will hold. Now I'm not planning to over tighten this uh, screw once it's set back in, but um, you know, at least that screw will be in there and hopefully provide some retention to get this to sit right with inside the housing. Now, because I taped off and painted the top when I removed the tape, I'll zoom back out, I pulled off quite a bit of paint across the, the face of this uh, amplifier housing as well. You know, this is, this is old paint, it's peeling away, uh, you know, quite a bit of corrosion and rust has gotten underneath the paint, which is the cause for that. Uh, if you can't tell by the face, it's rather patina pretty well. And obviously you saw the corrosion from what I worked on, uh, removing all that rust and stuff from the inside. But um, what I did, because I don't have any paint or anything, uh, is I went ahead and took a black Sharpie and filled in what I could. And then I took a silver shop sharpie to kind of make that border again, even though it's white. And then used a silver sharpie to finish out the 80 and the XL over here. That was well, the L wasn't removed, but a portion of the of the eight, the zero, and the X entirely was removed. But now that's. Uh, by uh, Sharpie marker been put back in. <laughs> That's about as good as it's gonna get, I guess. Uh, I did all this off camera because I actually forgot to put in this plate. So I had to completely remove everything again and put it back together. You know, the old at the saying, measure once, cut twice, uh, does not fall flat to me. So. If you don't pay attention, uh, you're going to end up doing more work than you plan to. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to allow this two-part epoxy JB Weld to uh, cure overnight and uh, we'll button it back up in the morning. It's rather late, everybody else is in bed and I'm still up like an idiot, so I'm going to get some sleep as well. We'll see you in the morning. So you may be asking yourself, well, Sean, you've been testing channel B. What about channel A? Uh, and you'd be right. Uh, it's the next morning for me. I'm well rested and I can't believe that I forgot to uh, also include that part of the amplifier. So we're going to look at it next and some unique characteristics of channel A. Uh, first, we're going to test the sub potentiometer. Now, I'll show you the uh, PDF file in a minute, but we're supposed to get somewhere around 9 dB of boost at 80 Hertz. So, as you can see, right now I have my SIGGIN set up for 80 Hertz, 52 millivolts. And on my O-scope, you can see that nice waveform. Uh, what I've done is I set my sub, focus, and lead controls max clockwise. I've also turned my level control max clockwise, but my gain control I'm only turning it up 
and to the point where I see audio clipping and then I'm backing off slightly until I have a nice waveform. And that appears to be around 81, 82 volts. So we'll record that down. 82 for sub. And we'll go fully counterclockwise. And that gets us down to... Uh, say that's... 30, 31, seems to be more predominantly around 31, so we'll record that. That was my sub control fully counterclockwise, and we'll bring that back up. Okay, so I have 82 and 31. Now, we don't test the focus, and I'll show you why here in a little bit. But now we're going to do the lead. Uh, the lead should be 15 dB of boost at 1K Hertz. So, let's see. Where's my 1K Hertz is what we need to set this to. I don't know why I said 80 there, and that's 80 hertz. See, it didn't change anything on my oscope. That is my bad. Uh, I made the change uh, for the frequency on the SIGGEN itself. Uh, I didn't make the change through the software, so uh, please keep in mind that this was, even though it said 1000 hertz here, it was actually at 80. So I will actually make the change through here now, 1 K Hertz, and you can see that corresponding change on the SIGGEN, just for confirmation, uh, and on the uh, oscope, sorry, and the SIGGEN, uh, now we are at 1 K Hertz, again everything is max clockwise, I am going to turn the gain back down again, and it appears that we have decent waveform at around 80 volts so this is for the lead control and let's go counterclockwise so that's going to get us down to 18.6 19, I'm going to put 18.6. So what we're primarily focused on here is this sub control. 9 dB of boost at 80 hertz. Our starting value was at 82 volts. Our end value was at 31. And we're getting uh, 8.4, so just shy. Uh, I suppose that's, that's well within uh, tolerance um, so we'll call that good and now let's try the second portion we're looking at here is the lead control that's 15 dB of boost so 80 and 18.6 see what this comes to 12. So we're low again on our lead control, but again, uh, I think that's pretty close. Uh, it's, it's close enough for me to say that we are most likely pretty good on that side of the board. Now, I do want you to take notice of this focus control and see how it says proprietary circuit. I actually want to show you what channel A does uh, versus channel B. All right, so channel A is all about shaping your audio waveform. That's why channel A says shape matrix. This is where you're going to uh, get that more grungy sound, the audio distortion sound, uh, or distortion is what's, what it's commonly referred to. 
Uh, so again, I'm gonna keep this on a 1K hertz at uh, 52 millivolts. And I want you to take note of our O-scope here. Now I'm not concerned about voltages or anything like that, but uh, I'm slightly increasing the gain, but mostly increasing the level right now. And see how we go into clipping once I increase that gain? Well, let me back off the level a bit. And then I'll increase the gain some more and back off the level. And increase the gain some more and back off the level. Increase the gain some more, back off the level. And look at what we're starting to get. A nice little sawtooth waveform. So that's with the gain turned almost all the way up and the level for the most part about mid-range. Uh, so we're introducing audio distortion at this point. Now our sub control is going to try to shape this a bit. You see how it rounds out the top? Almost like we're getting uh, back to a square wave. So you can see how the sub control is shaping that signal. Now, we'd probably see something a little more drastic if it was down at the 80 hertz uh, frequency range, but that is what is occurring there. Now again, uh, my sub focus and lead are currently fully counterclockwise, so I can demonstrate this to you. Now let's take a look at our lead control. Now skipping over to focus for a second, but our lead control gives us a full square tooth, uh, sorry, square wave. So you can see how that is shaping that audio. Now watch the focus control. Now this is a proprietary circuit on the, uh, according to the uh, PDF file we have where I'm getting those measured values. And look at this, you see how this audio is being shaped? So what this is, if I'm not mistaken, is phase modulation. We are taking that 1k hertz signal and modulating it in a way to change the phase of that signal to give us a different type of sound. Now if you were to take a tuning fork and, uh, and ping it to make it vibrate, you would see some, you would see, uh, and were to put a sound wave onto an oscilloscope, you would see something very similar to this. As a matter of fact, most instruments, uh, especially string in instruments as well, when you play them, they're not going to have perfect uh, waveforms. If you want to see what I'm talking about, uh, look up um, uh, on the old Google violin uh, waveforms. Anyways, that is the whole purpose of this section. Now, if I increase the sub after making that lead change, or sorry, if I here's where my focus is at. If I increase the lead you see that still takes us back to that square wave. Now if I change the sub, you see we're getting a bit more uh, low frequency roll off. Uh, anyhow, Just wanted to show you this so uh, you can see what uh, Channel A does. Uh, our boosts were relatively close, just a little shy. Uh, so I think we're call, we'll call Channel A good as well. And now measuring from tip 147 itself with probe one yellow on the O-scope going to the base and probe two purple on the oscope going to the emitter 
you can see the amplification. Now I'm setting my mid and high range to the middle because I do not want to distort the signal. But as I increase my level control, you'll begin to see the amplification. And the base yellow sine wave is going to be is going to have less amplitude than the emitter. So that is looking good. And now doing the same thing on uh, Darlington transistor tip 142, probe 1 on the base, probe 2 on the emitter, again on the oscope. The base will show up as a yellow sine wave, the emitter, the emitter is uh, probe 2 as purple. And as I increase, you'll see the amplification. Turn that tensioner pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, it's there. Looks good. Not overly distorted. I would say that that transistor is working as it should work as well. So good power transistors. Well, if you've stuck it out this long in this restoration series and in this video, I hope you've had the opportunity to really learn something uh, about guitar amps and I hope I uh, learned some things myself along the way. Uh, this was a fun restoration. Uh, this last part, this part four section, took quite a bit of time to get accomplished. I uh, actually spent multiple days. Um, it was uh, not the easiest thing to do, um, but it was worth it in the end, I think, to get a guitar amp. Now, uh, to sound as close as possible to what it did when it was first manufactured. Now, the intent wasn't to get this uh, amp to look as pristine as it did um, when it was initially made. Uh, you know, obviously it's patinaed a bit, rusted a bit, and everything like that, cosmetically there could be a lot more work done to it. But that wasn't the intent. The intent was to get it to sound uh, as it did when it was first made, to be honest. And I think overall, uh, that we were pretty successful in doing that. So if you like this video, please consider subscribing to this channel for more content like this. Uh, and also give this video a thumbs up. Now there is something I, I, I kind of want to share with all of you uh, before uh, closing out this, this uh, this restoration series and moving on to other content and I'm doing it now because I don't know how much longer the uh, the site will be available but uh, and, and I'm doing this for a family that's very dear uh, to my family the Lizenby family uh, there is a they have three kids and one of their sons a uh, relatively younger guy uh, passed away here recently um, while out hiking with some friends. Uh, it's really shaken in uh, the, our community and everybody we go to church with uh, really hard. Now, 
Uh, there has been a, and I'm going to get this out, y'all. I know uh, y'all don't owe me anything. I, I make content simply for the enjoyment of making content. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, there is a GoFundMe site. Uh, I'll put a photo of Nathan somewhere up in the corner here. Uh, and I'll put the link to the GoFundMe in the description down below. Uh, the family does not know I'm doing this, but uh, if you're inclined and willing to, to donate anything to assist a family, uh, please do so. I, I know it would mean the world to them. Uh, it would mean the world to me as well. Uh, with that being said, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for watching. Take care. Goodbye. Mark?